Praise the Lord for his goodness and his grace. Thank God that we have a Bible. Thank God that we're saved and born again. It's good to see everybody out today. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. It's good to have the carols with us. What a blessing that is. Amen. It's kind of like a, a blast from the past. And so it's good to see you folks. And so praise the Lord for his goodness and his grace. Good to be saved. Hebrews chapter number one in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter number one, the superiority of Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews is an incredible book, and it really is, in a sense, I've kind of entitled this series, The Key to Understanding the Law. And so to be able to get a good grasp of the Old Testament, the law specifically of the Old Testament, Hebrews has been called the uh, Levitic, Leviticus of the New Testament. And so, and there's a lot of neat things about uh, the book of Hebrews, and God just really opens up a lot of things. Uh, a lot of people are stuck that, and, and think and believe that the Old Testament had a different way of salvation than the New, but it's the same. It's for by grace you are saved through faith. And... Uh, the Old Testament looked towards the cross. The New Testament looks back uh, uh, to the cross, a Savior that has come. And so anyways, last week we discussed the reasons why we believe the book of Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul. But in reality, it is insignificant when we consider the author. Verse number one, if you see it, God. First word, God. And God is the author of the book of Hebrews, just as he is the other 65 books of the canon of Scripture. Amen. And uh, we see in this, uh, this matter, uh, one commentator mentioned it has been called an orphan epistle. It was an orphan epistle since it didn't have a signature, but uh, no doubt when you look at the book of Hebrews, it is signed by God. It's an amazing book. Uh, as we look at this, we see uh, there are uh, 21 epistles in the the New Testament. Some would say 22, considering the book of Revelation. Eh, kind of, maybe. And uh, the first nine are written to the Gentile churches, and it starts with the book of Romans and uh, ends with 2 Thessalonians. And those, those first uh, nine books were written to uh, Gentile churches. The next four are written to individuals, uh, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And then the next four after that are addressed to Jewish Christians, starting with the book of Hebrews, hence the title Hebrews, and uh, of course James, First and Second Peter. Some would say that First John through Third John and Jude and Revelation were written to uh, Jewish Christians as well. Uh, I don't really see the, the, that necessarily. I believe they're written in general to all Christians, as all the books are, but we do know that uh, First, Second Peter and James, specifically the, the, the address at the beginning points them to Jewish Christians. And of course, Hebrews as well, trying to keep uh, saved Jews from going back into the law and the temple. Since as we look at the book of Hebrews, the time of this writing, the temple was still in place in Jerusalem, uh, Herod's temple, and had not been destroyed yet, but I think God took care of that on purpose to cease the sacrifices and all of those different things, the, uh, the temple worship and ceremonial law. And so as we jump into this and we see this, uh, when we consider that it is written to the Lord's uh, book of Revelation, um, you know, when we look at that, it is written to the servants of the Lord. It says so in, in chapter number one. And I think the book of Revelation also could be considered epistle since it was in chapter two and three. There are specific letters that are written to the angels of those seven churches of Asia Minor. And so you could consider part of it epistle, but a lot of it prophetic. And so and it was to the servants, which I believe to be pastors and evangelists, that he's specifically speaking to. And so just a little bit of an introduction here on this. Now, the book of Romans introduces the first nine uh, church epistles, and it is an introduction to the relationship of the moral law with the gospel. When we get to the first of the Christian epistles that were written to Jewish Christians, we see Hebrews being that first book, and it is in relation to the ceremonial law in the relationship and how that the gospel and the ceremonial law are related to each other. And so as we look at this, I want you to notice this one thought. Our Savior is amazing. Yes. 
He is an amazing God. He is an amazing Savior. He is powerful. He's magnificent. He's wonderful. And so I want you to notice with me this morning the superiority of Jesus Christ. As we mentioned the key word last week, the word better, all through the book of Hebrews. And we saw that key phrase, let us. Because we have something better, let us do something for the Lord. Amen. And so as we look at this and we see this, the first thing I want you to notice, number one, I want you to see in verse number one, in the first part of verse number two, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. I pray you'd fill me and strengthen me now as I preach your word. I pray, dear God, that you would have preeminence this morning. I pray, dear God, that you would have me to say only what you want me to say. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd give me liberty to say everything that you want me to say. And Father, I pray now that you'd fill me and use me, guide, direct my words and my thoughts. Lord, I pray you'd open the hearts and minds of each and every one under the sound of my voice, whether they be here or online. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. And so as we look at this, the preeminence of Jesus Christ, look at verse number one in the first part of verse number two with me. God, who at sundry time in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And so as we look at the, the, the matter of the preeminence of Jesus Christ, I want to look at a couple of words there in verse number one, just to give you an under, understanding of what they mean. And sundry, it's simply more than one compound multiple. And divers, that means various. This is basically saying that God used multiple and different times to communicate with man. This truth is, the truth is that one man could never receive the entire revelation of God. Not one man throughout the, the, the Old Testament, when we, we get into to looking at how God laid out truth and he gave a little revelation here and a little revelation there and along the lines gave more and more to man because one man couldn't handle or keep it straight or understand it all in all that we have. Just as in the simple fact of the matter is from Genesis to Revelation, I wish I could tell you, boy, I'll tell you what, I know the Bible inside and out, backwards and forwards, and whatever doctrine it is, I can just lay it out there for you. But the simple fact of the matter is this book is a big book. And there's a lot of truth. And you know what? While I've studied and as we preach through the different books, when we preach through John and Genesis and we preach through uh, all these different books, we preach through 1 John, many of the different books we preach through, the book of Revelation, your pastor learned every time I studied those books. And you know what? I could go back to those books again and learn more because this is a living book. Amen. And it is without end and it is powerful, man. It is God's word. It's alive and well. It is quick and powerful as the Bible says in chapter number four of Hebrews. And so as we look at this and we see in this matter, this matter of the preeminence of Jesus Christ, it says here in this passage, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. The first thing I want you to know Notice his preeminence over the prophets. Jesus Christ's preeminence over the prophets. As we look at this, God has used many means to reveal himself to man. He uses creation, human conscience, law, religion, and men of God who in the Old Testament are called the prophets. In the Old Testament, he revealed himself to many different men in many different ways during many different times. God spoke to Adam and revealed that the Messiah would come through the seed of a woman. Are you with me? Then he goes on in uh, Genesis chapter number 12, 18 and 22, and he spoke to Abraham and revealed that the Messiah would come through his seed. And so Adam was given a little bit right after the fall. Abraham was given a little bit more. And then God spoke to Jacob and revealed that the Messiah would come through Judah, the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49, 10. Then God spoke to David and said the Messiah would come through his house, 2 Samuel 7, 13. And then God spoke. So, so we see it comes through a woman, which the lineage is down through the, the woman's seed. Obviously, Mary had the child. Amen. And so, and the father is God. And so when the Holy Spirit of God came upon her, you understand that whole situation. And then from there, it went to Abraham and it was narrowed down to his seed, the Abrahamic, the Jews. And then from there, it was down to the tribe with Jacob. And then from David, the very family in the tribe of Judah. And we see that. And then in Micah, the very location is given in Bethlehem. 
And then in Isaiah, the very person would be a virgin, Virgin Mary. Amen. And so we have a little bit of all of this coming through. And not one person was given all of the revelation at once because simply the truth is, is one man couldn't handle it all. And so as we see this, this miracle truth, but not only was it spoken to different men, but also the way he spoke, he spoke in different ways. And so uh, uh, sundry times and in divers manners, different ways that he spoke. He spoke to Moses, is, is Moses in a great thundering voice in the midst of the storm in Exodus 19, 19 and Deuteronomy 5, 22, a thundering voice. He spoke to Elijah with a still small voice. Are you with me? And so we see that. And then not only that, he spoke to Isaiah in a vision. Isaiah had a vision. And then he spoke to Samuel in a dream. dream. He spoke to Samuel why he was dreaming. And so God, all through the Old Testament, is speaking in all of these different ways to these different men. And then when you get to verse number two of our text, and it says here, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. The point to this is that each of these men could not present a partial revelation, the, the complete revelation of God, but a partial. The full revelation of God is not found in the prophets, the Old Testament. If all we had was the Old Testament, we would we'd be in trouble, amen? But praise be to God in these last days. So the time that Jesus was born until now, the Bible has called this, these last couple of thousand years, the last days. Now in Timothy it says, Paul writing to his son Timothy, he says, perilous times shall come. And it was in the future tense. Well, I'm here to tell you, we're now there, amen? We are in perilous times, and men shall be lovers, are lovers of their own selves. And so as we look at this, we see the full revelation of God is in his son, Jesus Christ. Turn over to 1 Peter with me, if you would, please. 1 Peter, we're going to take a, another journey through the scriptures. I want you to see this. 1 Peter, if you would, please, chapter number 1. 1 Peter, chapter number 1, in your Bibles. 1 Peter, chapter number 1, we're going to pick it up in verse number 9. When you get there, give me an amen, and I'm going to take a drink of water. First Peter chapter number one, look at what it says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. If you're saved in here, say amen. amen. It's good to be born again. That's kind of weak. And so anyways, verse number 10, look at what it says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto who? Us. Amen. And so the Old Testament prophets, they were searching for, they were looking for that time when the Messiah would come. But we, a blessed people, we see Jesus. Amen. And that's what it says over in Hebrews. We preached that not about two or three weeks ago. And so, and as we look at this and we see in this passage, the prophets diligently searched for it and they only had the partial revelation, but we have the complete. Amen. And it's Jesus, our Savior. Turn over to John chapter number one with me. John chapter number one. Hebrews, amen, has spoken unto us by his son. What a tremendous blessing it is that we have been, we have the full revelation of Jesus Christ. And someday we're going to see him face to face. I'm looking forward to that, amen. I'm glad that we can see him face to face in the word of God. John chapter number one, look at verse number one, if you would, please. Verse number one, you know this passage well, if you've been around church much at all. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word what? That's a capital W, amen. That is speaking about Jesus Christ. That is speaking of a person. The same was the beginning with God. Amen. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So we see in this passage right here that, listen, when we look about this matter of the preeminence over the prophets, the word of God, the very word, Jesus Christ is the full revealing of God himself. Now turn over to chapter number 14 with me. Chapter number 14 
14 in your Bibles. John chapter number 14. Actually, uh, actually, go back to Matthew. No, that's not right. Hold on. Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew chapter number 17. We're going to get to John 14, but that's going to be at a different time. Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew chapter number 17. I want you to see this as well. Matthew chapter number 17. Look at verse number 5. Verse number 5. Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John were up there with Jesus. Moses and Elijah appeared. And verse number 5, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son, capital S, talking about Jesus, and whom I am what? Well pleased. Do what? Hear ye him. The full revelation of God is in the person of Jesus Christ, who is what? God. Amen. Now turn back over to John. Back over to John. I know I could have put him in order, but I'd rather have you turn. John chapter number five. I want you to see this. This is good. John chapter number five, verse number 39. John 5, 39. 539. how much we would have missed if we hadn't had the New Testament. Amen? Look at what it says, 539. Search the what? For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which what? Testify of me. They testify of Jesus Christ. What scriptures did they have when Jesus was here on this earth? The only thing they had at that time when he was here was the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, amen? And he said, search those scriptures and in them, that's where you find me. I am all through the Old Testament. You want to know what the Bible is all about? It's about this one person, Jesus Christ, who is God. Now turn back over to Luke chapter number 24, Luke chapter number 24. I love this passage. I could, I could preach this every Sunday. I won't, but uh, I could. I love it. Amen. This is an amazing passage of scripture. Luke chapter number 24. I want you to see this. We're going to pick it up in verse number 13. The Emmaus uh, road. Amen. The disciples on the Emmaus road, that journey that Jesus took with these two guys. Man, I'm telling you what, these two fellows were blessed. Amen. They had Jesus right there with them. They didn't even know it was him at first. Look at verse number 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus and which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together all of these things which had happened. And, the say, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them whose uh, name was Cleopas answering said, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger uh, in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the, our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. Now, can you stop and think about this for a minute? This really is kind of humorous. I mean, Jesus is walking with them, the one who was in the tomb and now is not in the tomb, and they're telling the story about him, and they don't even know it's him. And he's walking right there with them. There's, yeah, he died. He was supposed to be the one that redeemed Israel, and he's dead. And they astonish us because he's not there. And so they're thinking somebody took the body. And so look at this. And uh, 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 scroll on down. Then said he unto them, O fools, verse number 25, and slow of heart to be believed, all that the prophets have spoken. 
Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so the prophets spoke about who? Jesus. The scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures are all about Jesus. It's all about that he would fulfill the Old, Cer Old Testament ceremonial law of the tabernacle, the shedding of blood, the burning of incense, the Sabbath days. All of it was fulfilled by Jesus. And look at what it says, verse number 27, I love this. And beginning at Moses, what's he talking about? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning what? Himself. What a tremendous God we have. And who could reveal that? Who is the one that could reveal that the Old Testament was all about Jesus? Only Jesus himself could. And that's exactly what we have here in the Gospels. And so look at verse, look at this now. I want you to see this as well. And this matter of, of the inbreathing, the inspiration of God, the understanding of the scriptures. Look over it, if you would please, at verse number uh, 44. Verse number 44 of the same chapter. And he said unto them, this is the upper room where over in John, it talks about how he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. This is a parallel passage. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? Me. And look at what it says here. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the what? He breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. Who's the one that leads us into all truth? The Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And so that wonderful breath of God. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior we have. And listen, he is much better than the prophets. The prophets could only give us little pieces. They could only give us little touches. But when Jesus came, then the understanding about who Jesus is and all of these things in the Old Testament that were mentioned, wow, our eyes have been opened under the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. What a tremendous God. What is he saying in Hebrews chapter number one, verses one and two? He says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And so he is preeminent over the prophets. He is better than the prophets. But not only that, he's not only preeminent over the prophets, but he has preeminence over all things. Look at what it says in verse number two once again. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of how many things? All things, amen. He's preeminent over everything. Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18, and he spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Jesus has all the power. Can I get a witness? Go over to John chapter number 13 with me. John chapter number 13 in your Bibles. John chapter number 13, look at it with me. John chapter number 13 in your Bibles. The Bible says in John 13, verse number 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father hath what? Given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Listen, it's not some prophet we're following. It's not some preacher we're following. We ought to be following Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, the multitudes may follow a guy by the name of Joel Osteen or Der Jeremiah or one of these other people they flock to. But the truth of the matter is, who's supposed to have preeminence in our life? Jesus. Jesus, not about a man. It's about the man Christ. Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world, who is God. Amen. If you're looking for a personality or a person, you better be looking for Jesus because he's the one that will fulfill. Can I get a witness? Amen. Jesus, knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. He is awesome and he is powerful and he has preeminence over all things. Go to chapter number 16, John 16, verse number 15. The Bible says, henceforth, I call you not servants for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father. I have made known unto you. Hey, listen, there's no secrets, not in this dispensation, 
In the church age, we have all the truth that we need to have. There's no extra revelations out there. There's no special speakings out there. Hey, listen, the writings of Josephus, those were writings of men. That's all they are. And there may be some decent history to follow in there, but the simple fact of the matter is not scripture. The apocrypha that they would try to squeeze in between the Old and New Testament, that's not scripture. We have scripture right here, and it is 66 books of a completed revelation of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen right there? Thank God we've got a Bible we can count on. We don't need anything else at all. We don't need something that relates to us better in our day. We don't need to rewrite it, amen? We've got it right here in the Word of God. It is an awesome, awesome book, and we've got everything we need right here. And listen, the simple fact of the matter is, if it's new, it's probably not true. And so as we look at this, we see in this passage, uh, uh, we see the preeminence over all things. Go to 17, verse number two, look at it. 17, two in your Bibles, 17, two. Did I read verse 15 and 16? I don't think I did. All things that the father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. That's John 16, uh, uh, 15, but also John 17, 2. Look at it with me. 17, 2. As thou hast given him power over how much flesh? That he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast what? Given him. Amen. And so the simple fact of the matter is, is Jesus, he is preeminent over all all things. Amen. He is all in all, and he is all you and I need. Can I get a witness right there? We've got an awesome God. Now go back over to uh, Ephesians with me. I want you to see this passage as well. Ephesians chapter number one, Ephesians chapter number one in the Bible, Ephesians chapter number one. Our society, and I, and I like to mention this often, and the reason is, is because it's so prevalent today. Most preachers today are busy telling stories instead of preaching the Word of God. The commission to the man of God, the pastor of the church, is to preach the what? Word. Word. Come on. But the Bible says in the last times they'll be turned from truth unto what? Fables. And so, listen, when you come to Solid Rock Baptist Church, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling stories. I, if you're a story person, I'm sorry, but that's not what's going to happen. Amen. I'm going to preach the Bible. I'm going to give you a ton of scripture because last I checked, the only thing the Bible says that does not return void is what? The word. And so praise the Lord. You're going to get a lot of Bible. And so anyways, just a, a little plug in there for you. So I hope you don't get tired of turning in passages and looking at your Bible. This is what matters. This is where eternal life is. And Jesus literally is the word. And so look at this now. Ephesians chapter number 1, look at verse 20 through 23. 20 through 23. And this will also help us keep away from opinions. Just preach the Bible. Preach the book. 20 to 23, look at what it says now. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the what? And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in the world but also in that which is to what come and hath put how many things all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over how many things all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all and so He's preeminent over everything. And then we can go to the one verse that really talks about the preeminence of Christ, Colossians chapter number one. Go there just a few pages back. Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter number one. Look at verse number 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. The church. And this is so key in understanding when the church started as well. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. He is everything. He is everything. And he is preeminent over everything. He's better than the prophets, amen. Yeah. 
because he helps us to understand the prophets. He is the full revelation of God the Father. Jesus Christ came to this earth to give a full revealing of who God is. And you know what? He did it very well. Look at our text with me once again, Hebrews chapter number one, Hebrews chapter number one, Hebrews chapter number one, verse number one, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And then not only do I want you to notice the preeminence of Jesus Christ, but I want you to see the performance of Jesus Christ, the performance of it. Look at that verse with me, by whom also he made the the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Uh, are you with me? When he had by himself purged our sins. So we see the performance of Jesus Christ. We see the preeminence. He is over everything. He is preeminent. He is to be uno numero in our lives. Number one. That's who he's supposed to be. But not only that, we see the performance of Jesus Christ. And might I say, just before we even get any further, everything that Jesus did, he did perfectly. Everything that Jesus does, he does perfectly. And everything that Jesus will do will be done perfectly because he is awesome and he is powerful. The performance of Jesus Christ, man, as creator, we see here, and I'm just going to touch some of this as simple stuff, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus Christ is the creator. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Amen. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. What a tremendous God we serve. Amen. I don't know about you, but I had a cup of coffee this morning, dark roast, black, bitter, but smooth. It's got to be that way. And if you don't drink it that way, I doubt you're probably a Baptist. But anyways, (laughs) hey, listen, I'm here to tell you right now. I cooked that in there. I don't know about you, but you may not even like coffee, but who does not like the smell of coffee? It's like... Oh, man, it's a good smell, amen? You know, God created the smell for you to smell the smell of good coffee. I don't know about you, but, man, I'll tell you what. You slap a T-bone steak on the grill, and you get that thing a-simmering and cooking, amen? Can you smell that? God created that. The smells you enjoy. And the smells you don't, too. Amen? Hey, listen, I'm here to tell you something right now. He created all that. And that taste, when you stick that melt in your mouth, you know the one side of the T-bone is always more tender. You know what I'm talking about? And you stick that in, it practically melts in your mouth, and it's just like, and you can just suck on it and get the juice out of that and get that full taste. God. (laughs) Hey, listen, I'm on. I'm on. I'm target creation. Amen? And taste that meat. You know, that's just a wonderful thing that God created. He didn't create it for him. He created it for us. What a tremendous blessing. You step outside and, and uh, the sunset comes down over on this side over here behind this tree over here. And that red sky lights up and you see that sun coming down and you stop that tree. That may not be a, maybe a trash tree like Tony calls it. Amen. But it's a beautiful tree. It's shaped just right. Amen. And boy, you look at that thing and that sun, it is gorgeous. And I step out there and I see that sometimes and I'm just like, wow, what a, what, a, what a pleasure for my eyes. God created that, amen? And then those sounds, we sing and we hear sounds that we enjoy. What a blessing. God created sound. You hear music and singing and, and we had a bird in here this morning. We have a bird problem. We're going to fix it here pretty soon. I got all these blocks we're getting ready to put all the way around the building. Composite. They'll never rot. And they'll never be able to be pulled out. I can't wait. Right back in the back, they're probably back there singing right now to Devin. And so anyways, listen, I'm here to tell you, we're getting rid of those things. There was one in the church. I heard him yesterday skimmering across the ceiling. I'm like, great. And I was like, this is going to be an interesting service tomorrow. And so anyways, that little rascal had managed to find his way out. And he was in the kitchen 
<laughs> he likes to eat too, amen? And so, and he was back there in the back corner, and I was able to catch him and let him go. I didn't kill him. Everybody's like, why didn't you kill that stupid bird? He's going to come back. Trust me, we're going to fix the problem. I just didn't want blood on my hands before I preached. And so anyways, God is good. Now, if it had been a deer, that'd be a different story. And so <laughs> anyways, as we're thinking about this and all of these things, the sounds... You hear the birds chirping. You hear the wind blow. You feel the feeling. All of this creation that God created it. Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. Man, the things that we get to enjoy in life, all because of Jesus, our creator. He's the creator. The performance of Jesus Christ in creation, even in a fallen state, let's just be honest, is pretty incredible. Can you imagine what it must have been like before the fall? And then also, not only as creator, but also as expressor. He's the expressor. Look at what it says in verse number three. Who being, not being in or being like, but being the, ex, the, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Right. Being, he is the expressor of God the Father. And it says that he is, are you with me? Is God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and they are one. And when you stop and you chew on this, he is who being the brightness of his glory. You want to know the glory of God? Look at Jesus. You want to see the image of God? Look at Jesus. He is, not going to be, not will be, not was, is. That's right. And so as we look at this, we see this matter of the expressor. Go to John chapter number one with me. John chapter number one. I want you to see this. John chapter number one. John chapter number one. Look at verse number 14, verse number 14, well-known verse. Many could probably quote it. John chapter number one, verse number 14. When you get there, say amen. amen. The Bible says in verse number 14, and the word was made what? Capital W, Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. And so we see right here that he is the expressor of God the Father. Turn over to chapter number 14 with me, John chapter number 14. I told you we were going there. I was jumping ahead of myself by quite a bit. John chapter number 14, look at what it says. John 14, 9 and 10. And the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and ha yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen the Father, he that has seen me hath seen the what? Father. Because they're one and the same. Yeah. Seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in what? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Amen. He doeth the works. And so when we see this here, he's the expressor of God. He is the expressor of God the Father. Listen, the Bible talks about how that we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. But over in the book of Ephesians, it says that Jesus Christ dwells in our heart by what? Faith. So who's the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Who's the Father? Jesus. Who's, the, who's Jesus? The Father. Who's Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? Jesus and the Father. They're one and the same, but yet they're different. <laughs> Wrap your head around that, amen. Oh, it's like water. It can be a solid, it can be a liquid, and it can be a vapor. That doesn't quite cut it, amen. <laughs> I'm here to tell you right now, that is not a good illustration. And it's about as close as we can wrap our heads around it. But I'm glad that I've got a God that I cannot completely figure out, amen. Because if I could completely figure it all out, you might want to put a title on my name. And I don't think that'd be a good thing, Amen. I'm glad that God is still God and we don't have him completely worked out. I'm glad we got salvation worked out. I know that I know that I know that I know that when I die, this old boy is going to wake up and see Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Praise be to God. And so we see the expressor, but not only the creator and the expressor. Go back to Hebrews chapter number one with me. Look at verse, uh, I believe it's three. Verse number three, once again, we not only see the expressor, but we also see uh, uh, as sustainer, the performance of Jesus Christ as creator, as expressor, but also as sustainer, the sustainer. And look what it says. And it says, 
and upholding all things by the word of his power. Upholding how many things? all things. God, the creator, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he upholds everything. Listen, I'm here to tell you the earth is still spinning because God wants it to. Can I get a witness? And I'm here to tell you something right now. If it hadn't been for God giving man the brains that he has, then that rocket that deterred that planet killer just not to, did you hear about that? There was a meteor coming towards us, and they deflected it with a rocket because it was a planet killer. I don't know if you heard about that, but that's the truth. That's a true story, amen? And so uh, I'd say something else, but you all think I'm a racist. But anyways, moving along. And so and my father-in-law says it all the time. <laughs> but God help me. And it always pops in my head because of my father-in-law. Thank you, Jerry. Anyways, and so anyways, we look at this, we see this. It's really not that bad, but it is funny. And so as we look at this, we see this, the sustainer, amen, as a sustainer, Colossians 1, 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things things what consists he's the sustainer by the word of his power when God spoke it happens amen when God speaks it happens when he said let there be light there was what <laughs> when God said peace be still what happened to the sea of Galilee Shook, like a sheet of glass amen I bet it was absolutely 100% still everything when he said peace be still I bet the birds stopped whistling I bet the crickets stopped cricking. Man, I wish he'd say that. And so and I'm telling you right now, man, what a tremendous thing. We used to have a terrible cricket problem in the church. And when I'd be studying, those things would be going off. And I'd spend most of my time chasing crickets, trying to kill those stupid things. Drive me nuts. And so anyways, as we look at this, this matter of a sustainer, amen, when he speaks, it happens. When he said, be thou clean, those lepers were what? Clean. Absolutely 100% whole. No impurity whatsoever in their body. Can you imagine what it must have been like? What an awesome God. Not only do we see he's the creator, the expresser, and the sustainer, we see the performance of Jesus Christ also as Savior. Look at what it says now. It says, when he had by himself. You think those two words are important? Oh, yes. By himself. Yes. It's not Jesus plus or minus anything. By himself purged our what? How did he do this? By his death, burial, and resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel of Jesus Christ. How did he do it? By the shedding of his own precious blood. It's not him plus a good religion. It's not him plus the law. It's not Jesus and the Sabbath. It's not Jesus and burning of incense. It's not Jesus and even our prayers. It's Jesus, 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 him and him alone. It's not me being a good Christian. It's, listen, I can't even keep my own salvation, much less earn it. Can I get a witness? Listen, everything is hinged to Christ. Hey, listen, the simple fact of the matter is, is if you try to put anything with Jesus at salvation, it ruins salvation. And a person who believes that they have to continue to live a good life after they get saved, they were never saved. Are you with me? If you believe you can lose your salvation, I'm sorry, you ain't saved. Because your salvation is not based in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's finished. It is completed, purged by himself. 100% Jesus. And it's an amazing thing. First John chapter number 1, verse number 29. John the Baptist said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John didn't say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, as long as you do this too. Jesus takes away sin. Can I get a witness? Listen, the penalty of sin that would cause us to have to die and go to hell and pay for our own sin has been covered in the blood. If you're saved in here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank God for an amazing Savior. As we look at this in 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from some sin. It says all. And listen, when you look at Jim Frost, hey, listen, physically, and the old man, all dirty. But that new man, 
that got born again when I was born of the Spirit of God, perfect, sinless. That new man of me never sins. That's how you understand 1 John chapter number 3. It says, he that has sinned is not of the Father. You're right. That old man is not of the Father. Amen. But the new man, that spirit man, the spirit of Jim Frost has never sinned. And you know what? Nor can it. Thank you, Jesus. And he sinned that I commit from here on out. Listen, it's the old guy. It's that old, rotten, sinful. And I'm, I don't know about you. Someday the rapture is going to happen. A local New Testament church, we're out of here. And it, we're going to get a brand new body. The old guy is going to be kicked to the curb, and the new guy is going to step in. Amen. Not just a spirit, but also a brand new body, a brand new flesh. And, man, I'm telling you what, that flesh is the only kind of flesh that can walk on the streets of gold in heaven. Whew. Pure, powerful, no more aches, pains. I won't have to move my glasses down so I can read the text. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man, I'm telling you something right now. I'm 49 years in holding. I don't think I'll ever turn 50. And so anyways, the simple fact of the matter is these eyeballs are driving me crazy. But I can't wait. Rapture happens. No more spectacles. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll just be spectating with some brand new eyes. I'm going to see things differently too. Amen. It's going to be wonderful. Man, what a savior. All because of Jesus, I get to go to heaven. I'm going to get a brand new body. I'm going to get to be in the presence of God. And we're going to be able to worship and holler out with the angels, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. What an awesome God we serve. First John chapter number 3, verse number 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Man, I'll tell you what, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 21, and he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Man, he took our sin, we take his righteousness. What a tremendous blessing, amen. What an awesome God. His performance is spotless. He does and did and will always do all things well. He is awesome. John chapter, or Romans chapter number one, verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto the Jew first and also to the Greek. Listen, I'm not ashamed because it is the power of God. Salvation, he is an amazing savior. He alone purged our sins. It's not him plus or minus anything else. Can you say glory, hallelujah? Right there, amen. The preeminence, the performance of Jesus Christ. And then I want you to notice lastly, the position of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number three once again, that last statement. And it says, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There's two things I want you to notice. Number one, I want you to notice the significance of his position. The son of God is seated. And you know what? When you've got a job to do, you do that job and you don't sit down until what? It's done. Amen. And Jesus has sat down. Hey, listen, the simple fact of the matter is he completed his job and he is seated. John chapter number 19, verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Jesus completed the work that he came to do. Go over to Colossians chapter number two with me. Colossians chapter number two. Colossians chapter number two. You got to see this. This is great stuff right here. You ought to get excited every time we go to this. Pa you ought to get excited every passage we go to. Amen. Amen. Listen, this book is awesome. It's powerful. It's magnificent. And boy, what it says is amazing. Look at verse number, uh, pick it up in verse, uh, where are we going to start off at? Um, Verse number 14. Let's look at verse number 14. I ah, back it up to verse number 13. Yeah, why not? And you being dead in your what? Sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, that word quickened means to make alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespass. How many? All. all. Every one of them. Past, present, and future. Can I get a witness right there? All. Verse number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to your cross. 
his cross, amen, hallelujah, and having spoiled principalities and powers, yes. he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Are you with me? Man, it is finished. He completed the task, amen. Look at this now. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The Old Testament was a shadow of things to come, and Jesus fulfilled the shadow. Amen. He laid his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, not pitched with hands. Amen. We're talking about the real thing. And so when we look at this, we see this. Man, it's finished. He completed it. Amen. It's not an unfinished work. You look at yourself and say, man, I got a long ways to go. Well, actually, not really. The simple fact of the matter is, is we are everything God wants us to be right now in the spirit. Are you with me? Everything. Now, this old flesh and everything like that, listen, it's fading away. Amen. I'm here to tell you, my Lord, I helped Devin yesterday with his camper. I was on my knees. My knees were so sore after I got done putting a little tiny floor in. It was 150 degrees inside that little stinking camper. But anyways, and I, I helped him do that. I put that in there, and I got up, and my knees are just sore. They were beet red when I got home. I was like, oh, man. You'd think I was 90 years old or something. Amen. Terry was picking on me on the phone the other day. I was telling him about it. <laughs> I'm just like, man, I can't believe this. My back was hurt. My knees were sore. But this is just all old. It's all old. And yes, we're working and serving and trying to do our best for the Lord, trying to put our treasure in heaven. But the simple fact of the matter is, listen, I'm already everything God wants me to be in the spirit. And you know what? The realization of that completion is going to happen at the rapture. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number two that we are present tense, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Are you with me? We're just kind of, I, I, it's hard to explain, but man, we're a finished work already. When Jesus said it is finished, listen, all the work that was needed to be done was done right then and there, Amen. and Jesus did it. Amen? What an awesome God we serve. And so when we look at this, we see in Colossians chapter number two, he removed it all out of the way. Those things that were against us, they're gone. Can I get a witness? Now, we still struggle in this flesh and in this world and in this, in this present moment. But the simple fact of the matter is, is the completed work in Jim Frost has already been done. I'm on my way to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible kind of talks like I'm already there. Amen? That's why he speaks of glorification in the present tense. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. <laughs> what an awesome God we serve. Amen? Go over to Romans chapter number 10 with me. Romans chapter number 10. I want you to see this. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Romans chapter number 10 in your Bibles. Romans chapter number 10. Look at verse number 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. For what? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God where? In him. It's that matter of righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know, I mentioned in the introduction that Romans relates to the moral law, and it does. But it's for, listen, Christ is the end to the law. How? For what, though? Righteousness. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden we can run around naked. It doesn't mean all of a sudden we can do and live however we want. We can steal. We can lie. That doesn't mean that at all. Amen. Jesus came to fulfill the ceremonial law. You can't fulfill moral law. It's moral law. It's right and wrong, no matter what dispensation you live in. Can I get a witness? So the Old Testament law has not been done away. He came to fulfill it, and that's what he did. And so as we look at this, the simple fact of the matter is, I had not known sin if it had not been for the law. And so as we look at this, we see, yes, the law shows us that we're sinful and brings us to grace. Amen? 
And so, but that doesn't mean once we get saved, we can live any way we want to, because the Bible very clearly says that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and that we should live. Uh, uh, go to Titus chapter number two with me. Titus chapter number two. I don't want to miss it. Amen. Titus chapter number two. Titus chapter number two. I don't want to just quote it. I want you to see it. There's a whole crowd. There's the grace crowd. We can live any way we want to now since we're saved. The Bible says in verse number 11 of Titus chapter number 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? And what does it do? Verse number 12, this is what it does. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Doing what? looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This all stems back to grace who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all what? And purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of what? Good works. And he says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all what? Authority. People have a real problem with authority today. They get mad when a preacher stands in the pulpit and with authority preaches the truth of the Word of God. They call him authoritarian. I actually went to a church one time and uh, one of the members slipped me a piece of paper after I preached and said, beware of authoritarianism. And I was like, what? That's because I preach, thus saith the Lord, with some passion, zeal, like I actually believed it, amen? And so anyways... God help us. Authoritarianism <laughs> help us. Listen, God wants us to speak with all authority. And so when we look at this and we see this, we got a society today that does not like that. Too bad. I'm still going to do it. Amen. And so we see in this passage the significance of his position. It's finished. And then the significance of his location at the right hand of the majesty on high. Listen. We ought not be seeing Jesus as a babe in a manger. We ought not be displaying Jesus Christ dead on a cross. He ain't not dead, amen. He ain't not a little uh, helpless baby. Can I get a witness? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the way we ought to view him. And sadly today they've taken this, this queer from Europe with long hair that was painted as Jesus Christ and they take that as, as a, a sign that that's what Jesus looks like and people worship that stupid picture all over the place. My Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Are you with me? And if it's a shame for a man to have long hair, he ought not have long hair. Can, can I get a hallelujah right there? And listen, I'm here to tell you something right now. You do the history research on that painting, it goes back to a European queer. That's who it was. And, they, and is that not just the way Satan works? Yes, it is. Try and get people to worship something that is just absolutely perverted. And now look where we're at today. Yep. Amen? I'm here to tell you something right now. It's not okay, and God's not okay with what's going on. This whole pride month. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Amen? That's what it does. And the Bible says, uh, broad is the way that leadeth to what? Destruction. Pride goes before what? Destruction. You tie it to Matthew chapter number 7. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in their end. God help us. Oh, pride month. A dumb as a box of rocks, amen. And so anyways, they label that and then they try to steal the rainbow. They don't even understand that the rainbow was just a, a freedom from the judgment of flooding the world. God's still going to burn this world up, amen, just like he brought down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Some of these knuckleheads, they try to say, well, the word sodomy in the Bible actually means pedophilia, which is, which is uh, they were molesting children, and they're against that. Well, I don't know. I think the chant in New York City in that parade the other day, when they said, we're here and we're queer and we're coming for your children. What does that tell you? Nude men. Lewd and nude. Wicked. God help us. Amen. There ain't enough people standing up against this garbage and craziness. God help us. Amen. Praise the Lord. I've sidetracked, haven't I? The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 19, verse number 16, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We ought not see him as a helpless babe or a dead savior 
or even in a grave, but we ought to see him as the majesty on high, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. No one looking around. Let me ask you a question. Do you know 100% for sure you're going to heaven when you die? If you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, you're saved. The Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit itself bear witness with your spirit, as it says in Romans 8, 16. It's not that you're telling yourself you're saved, but God actually says and confirms you're his child. You know that you know you're saved. Would you slip your hand up as a testimony of heaven? God sees those hands. Thank you for that. You can put them down. Listen. If you're here today and you do not know that 100% for sure, you're not sure. Listen, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. I just want to pray for you. I would never come to you. I'd never embarrass you. I'd never do anything like that. This is a personal decision. We don't try to drag people down the aisle. I do prompt and I too plead. But I'm not going to try and drag you down the aisle. That's a decision you have to personally make of your own free will, not because somebody dragged you. If you're not 100% for sure you're going to heaven when you die, would you slip your hand up? You're not sure you're saved. I just want to pray for you. Just want to pray for you. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. He's preeminent over all things. Child of God, does he have first place in your life? Is he truly number one? The performance of Jesus. Do you recognize that everything Jesus did, does, and will do is absolutely perfect and the best? And that includes in your life as well. He does all things for a reason. And I dare say it's no mistake that you're here this morning. And then lastly, his position. Are you trying to get saved or is it a finished work that's been done in your life by the perfect work of Jesus Christ? The finished work. He did it. He completed it. It's a salvation he provided. Can't earn it. Can't obtain it or hold on to it. The Bible very clearly says we're kept by the power of God. Not our own power. Not our own ability. When we sin, it hurts our fellowship with God, but it never changes the relationship. A child of God is always his child. Child of God, if God spoke to your heart this morning in some way, shape, or form, would you slip your hand up as a testimony in heaven? God sees hands all over the room. Thank you for that. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness, grace. Pray you bless now the invitation. Work and move as only you can. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. The piano's playing. If you need to come, the altar's open. If you raise your hand, let God have his way. Come hit the front row if you can't kneel. If you can kneel, come around the altar. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Is he preeminent in your life? He's preeminent over all things. Listen, not only that, his work, his performance is perfect. What's going on in your life and the things that God has allowed in your life and even directed in your life is what should have happened. You can either use it as a, a hindrance for your faith in Christ or you can use it as a step to grow. The Bible wants us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the different events of our life are all designed to help the child of God go forward.